Good morning, everybody. My name is Laura Greenhouse, and you're watching Politico Live. I'm the managing editor overseeing all our policy coverage here at Politico Europe, and I'm really happy to welcome you today to our discussion, Surfing the Renovation Wave, Can Europe Build Back Better? This morning's discussion closes our Rebuilding Europe 2050 series, which we've launched in 2019. Through this series, we've discussed how Europe plans to decarbonize the construction and building sector and meet its climate neutrality and energy goals by 2050. We've held three working groups. One, decarbonizing the built environment that we held here in Brussels. The second, on sustainable cities, which we held in Warsaw. And thirdly, promoting renovation in buildings and affordable housing, the final working group, which we held remotely. So as we close the series today, we'd like to thank our partner, Wholesome, for making this virtual event possible, and all our viewers for joining us online through our four platforms. You can watch today through our event website, on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn, and we'd also love you to get involved. So please participate this morning by tweeting at Live Politico and asking your questions via Slido using our hashtag RebuildingEU. If you're following us from the event website, you'll find Slido embedded below the live stream window. If you're following us from Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, just use the Slido app on your computer or phone to ask your questions. So to show you how it works, I'll invite you to log into Slido now, and you'll see our poll presented by Holsim, which asks, in the context of the recovery funds and of the renovation wave, should EU financing mechanisms focus on Number one, deep retrofit. Number two, innovative building materials and solutions. Number three, upskilling and reskilling, or all of the above. And I can see we've already got some uh, answers in there, so look forward to seeing your answers at the end of today's event. Now we've got the logistics out of the way, let's turn to the subject of today's discussion. So Europe's buildings represent about 40% of the bloc's energy consumption and 26% of its carbon dioxide emissions. That has to change if the EU is to meet its goal of becoming climate neutral by 2050. But that change won't be easy. It involves individuals, governments, and businesses ranging from multinationals to one-man operations. As new building techniques move towards sustainability, there's also the problem of what to do with all the existing buildings. About 35% of buildings are over 50 years old. So where does Europe's building sector go from here? To begin our conversation, I'm very pleased to welcome Jan Jenich, CEO at Holsim. Jan, thank you for joining us today. Hey, good morning, Laura. Thank you for having me in your show. Um, so as you're of course aware, and as we've just discussed, the EU has set very ambitious targets for its building industry in a bid to hit climate goals. So my first question to you is, is that, are those targets realistic and is the industry set up to meet those goals? Yes, I think we are ready to be a part of this uh, solution and to achieve the targets together. I think it's uh, no doubt that uh, building has a huge need of building, of uh, renovation, of uh, making infrastructure uh, more energy efficient. And we want to be part of that. And we have just launched our newest uh, green solutions with largely CO2 reduced footprint. And we're very exciting to, uh, to uh, go on this uh, joint path and uh, achieve the goals together. So obviously there's gonna be a huge cost to this transition, all the buildings that need to be renovated, all the technological improvements and so on. So, Will that cost fall to individuals, to companies such as yours? Who's going to pay for this? Oh, it's, uh, it's great you mentioned the old buildings. I, I think that's a great opportunity for us. We have already uh, products, uh, especially in Europe, uh, which are using a large uh, content of uh, recycled demolition waste. So we literally take uh, the old concrete, the old bricks, and we fully recycle them and put them into, the new, into our new product. Uh, for example, we have in Switzerland, we launched our newest cement product, the Susteno, and this product consists already of 20% recycled demolition waste. So that's a fantastic uh, new cement product. Uh, we do the same with the concrete where we can go up to 50% uh, 
of recycling content. And the great thing about uh, especially our cementitious materials, they can be recycled to 100%. But just to come back to the question, who's going to pay for the cost of, of you know, all these new materials and, and obviously all these renovations? You will be surprised how, uh, how the math plays here with the recycling. If you have the circular economy like we have for our newest product uh, with recycling content in cement and in concrete, there is a very little premium you need to, you need to pay for these products because we are saving virgin material and replace them with uh, recycled waste. Um, I mean, I guess another way to look at this question is that, you know, Europe's economy isn't in the healthiest state right now, um, as, you know, countries begin to think very slowly about emerging from the coronavirus crisis. Um, and, you know, we've seen through the crisis that the US launched a massive infrastructure investment package, uh, but cash from the EU's own recovery effort hasn't yet been forthcoming. So I wanted to ask, you know, do you think the economic outlook in Europe will, will prevent Europe from meeting these renovation and construction goals? I think when we especially look at the US program, this uh, Biden's Build Back Better plan, I think that's a very brilliant plan because it combines a couple of, of very important factors to support uh, the economy, to support uh, employment, and also to reach out to uh, many, many people. So to give stimulus for construction, um, that helps a lot of people uh, for better living conditions. At the same time, uh, the increase in energy efficiency basically almost uh, pays for the renovation itself over the lifetime. So I think that's a very brilliant move also to combine it with the ambition uh, the new president in the US has for the climate and for sustainability. So we are very excited to also uh, be part of that with our products in the US. We also launched uh, just this beginning of the year, our newest uh, green uh, concrete products and also with our roofing solutions from uh, Firestone building products. We're very excited to insulate all the roofs in the US and to make them green and solar. Do you, does that mean that you see that Europe could fall behind the US in this industry? Um, I, I wouldn't say that. I think when you compare the level of uh, sophistication when it comes to energy efficiency and sustainable of buildings, I think Europe is, uh, is leading the way. So uh, now we have to build on that and make sure now that we develop the building norms now with some speed. Um, when I talked before about the recycling content in our products in Switzerland, um, this at the moment is not uh, permitted by the building your norms in the European Union. So here we need a clear push to make a sustainability happen also through the development of uh, the building norms. So one of the, the issues I wanted to ask you about, obviously, we know that the EU has set these, these very ambitious plans, but it's still figuring out exactly how to, to make that happen in Europe and, you know, particularly in the US context. There's an interesting question to be asked um, around one of the Commission's flagship policies coming down the pipe, the carbon border tax. So I wanted to ask you, um, you know, what do you make of the argument that this is, is protectionist and, you know, could damage global trade relationships? Do you, as somebody in, the, in one of the key industries that may be affected, actually think it will be workable in practice? Mm -hmm. Yes, you think I have a very practical view when, <clears throat> when it comes to the border tax. Um, at the moment, it's not an issue. At the moment, we have very little imports from none. European Union countries. And I personally believe that uh, later um, importing a large amount of non-EU cement, which tend to have very high CO2 footprint, plus all the transportation, this cannot be uh, the solution. And I'm sure we will find mechanism to uh, avoid this in the future. Um, just saying that at the moment, you know, we don't need a border tax at the moment because there is simply very little importing of building materials into the European Union. And I think we have to watch it and react when we need a reaction. So in that sense, is there a risk that, you know, a, a border tax that's trialed on, on something 
like cement will actually you know have very little impact in reality um at the moment um, again at the moment we don't need it we have a we have a, a bit of uh, imports but it's not uh, it's not key i think for us what is really key is to together innovate the building materials and come up with better and better solutions so we are already today in a situation that we can actually decarbonize our whole range of products by more than 30 percent if the building norms uh, keep the pace and if we are allowed to use those products so we're very excited to go that path and the border tax i'm i'm for it if we need it i think at the moment we should focus on innovation and making the sustainability happen so with that in mind, and obviously, you know, next we'll be moving to an interview with the commissioner on, on their forthcoming plans. So if you had to name one thing Brussels should do to make the industry more sustainable, what would that be? Oh, I think they should have a super focus on circular economy in construction. So to literally use all the old building material and make new products out of them. And, and we can do it. We can recycle 100% of demolition waste and make it into a new product. And I think this is one area they should focus and make the building norms adapting to these new uh, opportunities we have uh, through our advanced uh, products. And what's the most important policy to, to make that happen? Is it money? Is it standards? What, what's the kind of key uh, ask here? It's standard. So I think we should accelerate the development of the building norms, which is a very, uh, obviously, um, <clears throat> a very serious issue because it is uh, concerning the safety of houses and all that. But we need to accelerate. Uh, Switzerland shows it's possible. So here we are already able to um, bring products to the market with up to 50% recycled demolition waste inside. And I would love if we can have this situation also in the European Union. Thank you. So we're just about through our time this morning. Um, so I'm going to hand over um, to my colleague to continue the discussion. But I just wanted to thank you very much for your participation today, Jan. And it was uh, great speaking with you. So thank you, Laura. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Aitel Hernandez Morales, uh, to take us forward with today's event. Thanks, Laura. Uh, my name is Aitor Hernandez Morales, and I'm a, an energy and climate reporter here at Politico Europe in Brussels. My focus is renewable energy, the phase out of coal, and the thrilling topic of the decarbonization of buildings, which is, of course, what we're discussing today. And this morning, I am very pleased to welcome one of the top policymakers uh, who's focusing on making this happen on behalf of the bloc. Uh, that's Energy Commissioner Kadri Simpson. So uh, without further ado, uh, good morning, uh, Commissioner. How are you doing? Great. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning from Brussels. So, if you don't mind, we'll uh, we'll just jump into it. Uh, first of all, I wanted to I wanted to hear your perspective on this matter writ large. Why is there suddenly so much focus on buildings? And uh, if you can just tell our audience, what role do they fundamentally play in the bloc's Green Deal goals? Well, as we already heard from introductory remarks, um, there is uh, so much focus on buildings because. Uh, Buildings are an important sector of our economy. Um, construction and renovation actually generate almost 9% uh, of Europe's GDP. And, well, uh, and there are almost 8 million, 18 million direct jobs in this sector. And, and uh, they are very important uh, energy consumers too. So buildings are responsible for 40% of uh, EU's energy consumption and uh, 36 36 percent of energy related greenhouse gas emissions so um, these numbers actually make it very clear that uh, we will not reach our final goal we will not become climate neutral unless we address also um, um, uh, if we will tackle the building sector challenges and uh, the European green deal um, has brought the building sector um, to the top of our political agenda uh, and uh, and um, we need to well, consume less, but we need also digitalization, and and uh, and this is important also in the in the just uh, transition uh, angle. And um, and right now we know that uh, that uh, to achieve uh, our 2030 targets, um, 
we need to reduce um, buildings emissions uh, by 60% within the next nine years. And, uh, and of course, this requires a coordinated effort from many stakeholders. Um, and uh, we need to cooperate with regions and uh, member states to achieve this um, deep renovation all across Europe. And, uh, and, um, and um, what I mean by deep renovation, well, um, that, uh, that means that uh, it has to have energy efficiency and circularity at its core. Um, well, a little bit more numbers. 85% uh, of our buildings, they have been built before uh, 2001. That means that they were built when uh, energy efficiency was not so prominently present like it is right now. And, uh, and, uh, and that's why 75% of our existing buildings are uh, inefficient. Um, and uh, most of them uh, are still dependent on fossil fuels. So, uh, so um, this is another, uh, another angle of this. So, and, and we know Commissioner, that, you're, you're, you're yeah. laying out there the, 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 uh, the daunting challenge that the, that the block has ahead, uh, and, uh, and it's, it's very clear that a lot needs to happen in order to make those the 2030 goals that you've mentioned, and certainly the, the 2050 climate neutrality goal. So tell us a little bit about the Commission's plans, uh, in, in particular the renovation wave, which was launched last year, I know is the, is the flagship strategy. How in, in particular, what would you highlight are the, are the key parts of this, uh, of this strategy uh, that, that you see as, as, as being essential and, and also effective in terms of tackling this challenge? Well, yes, when I uh, introduced the renovation, renovation wave strategy, then I told to the wider audience that uh, it is a win-win-win situation, but actually um, this was under a statement because there are at least five wins um, because with the renovation we will create jobs, um, the economy will be stimulated, uh, people's living conditions will be improved, um, then buildings will be safer and uh, accessibility will be upgraded and energy bills will be reduced. So all, all this comes with our renovation uh, wave, um, um, and uh, and um, and um, right now we know that um, well, our our core objective is to at least double the rate of uh, of renovation of buildings already by 2030. Uh, we will mainly focus on public buildings, but also on residential sector, and it means that uh, we will renovate at least. 35 million homes, uh, but also schools and hospitals and, uh, and offices uh, by 2030. And, uh, and, um, and it has a much uh, wider impact um, because um, uh, we will also, um, also um, address the energy poverty um, issue. Uh, we want to uh, um, provide safe and affordable um, housing. And, uh, and, um, and of course, again, this requires coordinated action at all levels. Um, well, we can initiate it, but without uh, local policymakers, uh, without industry, and without uh, financial institutions' uh, support, uh, we will not achieve uh, these ambitious targets. So um, in this uh, renovation uh, wave, we proposed uh, four uh, actions. First, we will, uh, we will share better information and we will create um, legal certainty and, uh, and we will add incentives. Uh, so, um, for example, there will be um, uh, widely available energy performance certificates and buildings and innovation passports and digital building logbooks. And, uh, and, and uh, then we will also introduce uh, a manda mandatory uh, minimum energy performance standards for existing buildings. Um, in several member states, they do exist already. Some member states have uh, announced that they, uh, they will um, introduce them. Uh, and very good example is, for example, coming from Netherlands, that, uh, for example, their office buildings uh, shall have at least minimum of C-class in their energy performance certificate before they can be rented out. And then there are other, other technical uh, proposals. Uh, we will, we will um, um, make available uh, technical assistance. Um, um, we, will, uh, we will make available additional funding uh, and we will attract private investments. 
so that all those projects, uh, renovation projects in the pipeline um, can get sufficient financing. And then, um, then of course, we will promote also a digital construction value chain and smart buildings. So, so Commissioner, I mean, you're you're, you're mentioning some some really explosive of objectives there, and 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 uh, and uh, end goals that involve a lot of coordination with the member states, and 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 then also with the ground level. So, in in terms of of the of the practical obstacles ahead, what do you what do you see as the as the biggest challenges to actually implementing this, to actually rolling it out and and making it happen? Well, as I was uh, mentioning, well, um, this needs um, a, um, a um, good coalition with uh, local authorities, um, and um, and we already know that uh, several recovery plans are covering also renovation activities. So, um, so this is a broad and ambitious strategy. Uh, and, and the main challenge is to unite the market participants and, um, and streamline the process. Uh, for example, the challenge is um, faced by a single family home in the countryside that was constructed 200 years ago, uh, will uh, differ considerably from uh, um, a 60 year old multi apartment building. Hmm. So, um, this diversity is the main challenge yeah our, our um, architectural are, heritage across europe is is a major is a major uh yeah it's, it's it's both a blessing and a curse when it when it comes to this absolutely and there is no one size fits all solution so um we are aware of this and and uh, in this regard um, we're supporting action as um, um close to the people as possible um because it is also a great opportunity well as i was mentioning earlier this creates uh, it's very uh, uh, labor-intensive uh, activity. It creates jobs all across Europe, and uh, and um, what we are trying to achieve is member states and uh, the regions and cities and businesses. Um, we are trying to create um, a favorable favorable ecosystem, uh, starting with uh, one-stop shops and um, and um, complete service architecture. Um, to raise actually awareness of uh, and support for innovation, and and um, well, this is also coming back from member states so that they do need such competence centers with uh, technical assistance. You know, Commissioner, you, you you raised a point there that I'm that I'm sure is not only uh, exclusive to to this particular strategy, but to so many others from the Commission. That uh, obviously, with de with dealing with so many member countries and with such different conditions on the ground. There is a limit to how much you guys can can really lay out how this works, because the the solution that works, for example, in Spain, will not necessarily work in Germany, or will not necessarily be adaptable to the to the Netherlands. Correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, we do know that uh, that different member states do have different uh, um, well heritage, sure. uh, even different solutions how they heat or cool their rooms, uh, what kind of uh, energy sources uh, they they are dependent on. So let me ask you. Uh, next month, on July fourteenth, we're expecting the the Fit for Fifty Five package. What can we what can we uh, expect? And I, I'm not sure if you can give us any sort of preview as to as to what the contents might be with regards to to this entire uh, area. Well, um, this Fit for Fifty Five package. Um, well, we will be ready to present it in the middle of July, and uh, right now we know that uh, it will uh, it will be a uh, package of twelve legislative proposals. And uh, and to reach uh, well, um, and this helps us to achieve our higher targets for 2030. Uh, well, and it is clear that we need to update current legislation um, because we can't achieve uh, higher targets without changing anything. So um, um, and that's why this comprehensive um, package um, uh, will bring together different policy areas and different tools. Um, um, so, um, um, I, um, this package will include um, um, the revision of uh, Energy Efficiency Directive and the Renewable Energy Directive. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that um, since adoption of the Climate Target Plan, that, uh, that we have to increase both uh, renewable energy, uh, the share of the renewable energy in our energy mix, and, and we have to improve energy efficiency. So, again, as I was mentioning, buildings are an important element of this revision. Um, and um, 
for example, we plan to extend the renovation obligation to all public buildings, not just those of the central government, like it is right now. Mm -hmm. We are also considering um, more ambitious targets for renewables in the heating and cooling sector. Okay. Um, but, we, but we will leave flexibility to member states um, uh, who want to do more. We, we should expect that last part in the Renewable Energy Directive's uh, revision, correct? Exactly. Okay, excellent. Uh, let me just ask you, because we're getting several questions from, uh, from the audience about this. What, uh, what can you tell us about the uh, Commission's plans to include buildings within the, uh, the EU's emissions trading system? Well, indeed, uh, extending ETS system uh, will be also one of the um, legislative proposals in the, in the package. Um, and the reason is that this ETS system uh, in the industry and power generation has proven itself. And now we're, well, well uh, under the leadership of Fra uh, Franz Timmermans, we are looking how to, well, uh, how to support member states uh, to reach the necessary emissions reduction in the, in, in the sectors um, where emissions are still raising, like transport, or where they are decreasing too slowly, like buildings. And, uh, and uh, I can only quote our president, Ursula von der Leyen. She said that recently that, um, uh, that the idea is to um, introduce a separate emission trading system. Um, we will do it in a gradual way. And, uh, and um, this will be from the beginning uh, coupled with social compensation mechanism, because um, um, these two things, extending um, ETS and social um, a fund, they have to go hand in hand um, because it's obvious uh, that um, the burden um, cannot be on the most vulnerable. This is right. a clear test that uh, that Commission has, uh, that transformation has has to be socially just, and uh, and otherwise it doesn't doesn't take place. So um, indeed, a, a lot of the feedback that we've been getting in 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 our reporting, both uh, both speaking to you, citizens, uh, to NGOs, and then also uh, with, with representatives from member countries. I, I was speaking with the, with the Portuguese environment minister uh, about a month ago in Lisbon, and he was telling me that while on one side he, he absolutely was conscious of the, of the emissions that are coming from the building sector, he expressed some degree of concern with this plan, uh, just given the, 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 the extent of the challenge that, uh, that his country and so many Southern European countries face, and what that could mean in terms of an added burden uh, for, the, for the populace. So I, I, I assume the Commission is, is well aware of this and trying to find a, a way to, to, to square that circle. Yes, we are absolutely aware of this impact. But uh, there is another positive angle because uh, um, extending it, yes, uh, it, will, uh, it will support innovation in this sector. Um, well, there is so much innovation potential in that field, uh, and also many opportunities for medium and small size enterprises. Uh, so, um, well, this, uh, this helps us to, uh, to take advantage uh, of that sector. And, and um, well, from the energy side, I would add that uh, the extension of ETS um, would be balanced by the efforts um, in promoting energy efficiency because consuming less energy and uh, switching to cleaner and more efficient technologies um, would actually decrease the costs of, for people. And, uh, and, uh, and yes, uh, it needs uh, front-loading uh, uh, investments uh, but in the end, the benefits uh, are long term to uh, sustain uh, competitive. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Let me let me also ask you, because uh, we, we, we still have one more uh, big uh, legislative initiative coming at the at the end of this year, which is, uh, of course, the, the revamp of the uh, energy performance of buildings. Uh, what can you what can you what should we be we looking for in in, in that uh, in that revision? Well, indeed, uh, in the end of this year, uh, we will pr propose a revision of the energy performance of the buildings directive, and um, um, this, in spirit, also um, uh, is part of the Fit for 55 package, um, despite the fact that it will be adopted later this year. And uh, and um, well, when the July package will will also have a clear impact on buildings, and then this later proposal specifically focuses on them and. Uh, we we uh, we need to do something significant to put uh, the building sector on track to achieve that 2030 target, and then finally uh, long-term climate neutrality target. 
and uh, with, it, with this revision, um, we aim um, to increase the rate and depth of renovation mm -hmm. and ensure that um, your funds are used precisely for, for deep renovation, which uh, the increased climate ambition. And we also uh, want to make use of uh, digital tools mm -hmm. and provide better information and predictability through the um, introduction of um, and uh, minimum managed performance standards, which I already mentioned earlier. Commissioner, we're, we're, we're nearly out of time for this for this one on one part of our uh, of our chat. But I did want to ask you uh, before before we move on, and especially with uh, with the obvious relevance of the of the pandemic recovery plans and the national spending plans. Uh, what do you what do you what are you seeing? Uh, are you are you seeing good signs in terms of uh, renovation initiatives? I know that that Spain, for example, in its recovery plan has a massive amount of cash devoted to this and they're planning on taking on the greatest number of renovations in, in the country's history. Uh, what, are you, what are you seeing with the rest of the bloc? Are, are, are signs promising? Do you, are you seeing this, this, uh, this, these sorts of, uh, of measures incorporated into, uh, into most of the plans? Well, yes, the situation is uh, truly promising. And uh, we know that according to the existing climate and energy plans, there was a significant gap uh, how to achieve our overall energy efficiency uh, target. Uh, but now with uh, recovery plans, um, well, um, it, uh, it is obvious that member states are dedicating significant funds to this activity, and especially because uh, it helps us to uh, secure public support to our Green Deal ambitions, um, because in the end, you will consume less your heating pills or cooling pills with the uh, smaller and um, environment uh, more healthier, and it helps us short term um, to create um, to create jobs in the in the important sector. Uh, just a, a quick final question. This also comes from one of our of our audience members. Uh, they're asking about a, a joint uh, statement that was issued on Monday by by six member countries who were asking about uh, what role state aid might have in in supporting the renovation wave. I, I don't know if you can comment on that. Well, uh, this is not directly my uh, field of responsibility. Mm. Uh, but as you, as you are well aware, um, right now during the crisis, um, we have been very uh, cooperative and, uh, and um, we have been accommodating uh, different requests so that member states uh, can help their, uh, their industry to recover. Indeed. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Well, Commissioner, thank you so much for, for, for this portion. You're going to stick around with us now as we, as we shift over to our uh, panel debate. But before we do that, we want to check in on the, uh, the first of the two polls that we'll be having uh, going on during this political live event. So uh, the question to the audience was, in the context of the recovery funds and the renovation wave, uh, should EU financing mechanisms focus on deep retrofit, innovative building materials and solutions, upskilling, reskilling, or all of the above. And uh, it looks like the overwhelming majority chose all of the above. So uh, it looks like we'll, we'll need a, a coordinated effort to address this challenge. Uh, and now let's move on to our uh, panel debate. And we're going to bring in uh, panelists that are appropriately spread out across the block and even outside the block, uh, and who are here to uh, enrich uh, this uh, debate. So uh, from Paris, uh, we have Emmanuel Constantin, uh, Councillor for Renovation and Construction in the Cabinet of Emmanuel Wargon, uh, Minister Delegate for Housing. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, joining us from the UK, uh, from the Global Urban Development Network C40 Cities, we have Cassie Sutherland, uh, Director of Energy and Buildings. Good morning, Cassie. Good morning. Uh, and last but not least, in Stockholm, we have Lena Hurk, uh, Senior Vice President for Sustainability at Swedish Construction and Development Multinational Skanska. Good morning, Lena. Good morning. So, uh, before we go on with our panel discussion, I would like to remind our audience that you can participate in this event by tweeting about it at Political Live, and you can also ask questions, as Laura mentioned before, via Slido using the hashtag #RebuildingEU on uh, all the platforms that we're on. Uh, and please make sure to, to, to use your names uh, because it's always nice to know where uh, our questions are coming from. Uh, before we uh, move on, uh, we're also going to introduce the second poll for this part of the event. Uh, and you have until uh, the end of this panel discussion to fill it in. So uh, the latest question before us is, will the decarbonization of buildings be most accelerated by low carbon materials, performance standards for buildings, circular designs, 
or all of the above. You can see it there on the screen, and you can participate uh, by going online. So uh, now that the housekeeping rules are out of the way, uh, panelists, I just want to remind you, uh, don't hesitate to wave at me or, uh, or even to jump in vocally uh, if you want to react to each other's interventions. Uh, so right, let's get into this spirited debate. During our one-on-one, -on -one, uh, the commissioner was speaking about the renovation wave writ large, uh, but now that we have such a, a wide array of uh, representatives with us, uh, representing the affected sectors, I am curious to hear about how uh, we think this massive challenge can actually happen on the ground. So I want to turn first to Emmanuel. Uh, you're part of the team overseeing France's approach to building renovations. What would you say are the parts of, uh, of French uh, legislation, the French measures that you're, that you're proudest of? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, inviting me today. Uh, first, so we all know that uh, building energy consumption is our pine, the main part of our challenge. And as the Commission said, every EU member country has to make efforts to tackle that challenge. So in France, we have mainly two, uh, two focus. The, the, the first one is on new buildings. And we have a very ambitious new regulation uh, for new buildings uh, becoming effective in 2022, uh, which will set very high performance standards in terms of insulation, but also in terms of low carbon heating system. Uh, for example, in, in new homes, it will be forbidden to use uh, uh, gas or oil heating system uh, as of uh, 2022. And this regulation will be also very innovative in setting thresholds uh, for embodied emissions. Um, so we will use life cycle analysis, and it will it will really foster uh, both innovation in uh, low carbon materials and and circular economy. Because as as you know, in very high performance uh, new buildings, two thirds of the carbon footprint is actually embodied uh, carbon, and not only what uh, energy is consumed. So that is the, the focus on new buildings with this new pioneering regulation coming, coming into force in 2022. And the second uh, focus is on existing buildings and the challenge is even bigger. Uh, and that's why energy renovation is uh, one of the major priorities of the French recovery plan. And we are dedicating uh, almost 7 billion euros uh, over two years uh, for the renovation of existing buildings, both in uh, public uh, buildings for the government or local authorities, social housing, and of course, uh, private housing. Uh, so this 7 billion euros are coming on top of the efforts we were already making uh, in that direction. Uh, so uh, actually, that, that is something we can be proud of, but it can't go without any regulation or law or, or standards uh, in, at, at the same time. And we are passing a law that, is, that will forbid uh, to rent low performance houses in 2028. And that is uh, echoing what uh, the commissioner said about Netherlands. I think we, we are putting uh, minimal standards uh, to the house. And, it will address it will uh, address about uh, 1.8 million houses in in the next six years, and then it will extend to maybe about five million uh, houses or apartments or flats uh, uh, that will have to be renovated to be rented. And I mean that's a major social issue, and and maybe it's uh, it's also about. The, the debate the commissioner was pointing to, uh, the, the social debate. I mean, such regulations are quite uh, hard to implement. To It's it's really about cultural, social, political uh, preferences uh, in a country. And it, it's a hot uh, topic in France. Sure. Because you are really uh, going into uh, the house of the... Uh, yeah, you're going into people. people's homes, literally, yeah. Yeah, so it's 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 quite a challenge, uh, Cassie. I, I want to jump over to you as a, as our, our our panelist, who is is the voice of the cities. Uh, how do you see this playing out? Um, obviously, the block urban centers are 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 where 
you know, many of these buildings are concentrated. Uh, and I expect that that might actually be very interesting because municipalities might have greater leeway than, for example, national governments to, to uh, take more surgical actions or, or potentially faster actions. Is, 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 that, is that right? Thanks, Ito. Um, th and good morning, and thanks for having me today. So just as, as background for C40, for those who aren't aware, C40 is a network of 97 of the world's mega cities committed to addressing climate change. And, and C40 supports cities to collaborate effectively, sharing knowledge and driving meaningful, measurable and sustainable action on climate change. So we really are a, a global network, but have a number of EU member cities as well. Um, so, yeah, in terms of cities and the actions they can take, really cities provide a very strong enabling environment uh, for actions to take place. It can be accelerated and often go beyond and, and further and faster than national governments um, because of the concentration of population within the area, but also due to the, the powers and actions that cities can take. So we are seeing a number of cities leading already with uh, ambitious action on buildings, setting strong targets for new buildings, net zero carbon buildings by 2030, for example, across all new buildings, and then also taking strong action on existing buildings. We, we often see that cities sort of use their, their procurement power first and really lead by example with net zero carbon municipal buildings, so committing to owning, occupying, and developing buildings that are net zero, and, and using that to really send a strong signal to the market and to industry to be able to say, okay, we're now gonna get ready to be able to, to broaden this activity out into our social housing stock, our private buildings, and of course, a, a pipeline of, of new construction. So it really does help to kind of spearhead and lead some of that activity and ensure that the market is there and supply chain is there to be able to deliver wider retrofits or new construction. Sure, as the as the commissioner was mentioning before, you know, it, it really is going to be one of those things that depends on the particular conditions on the ground. So it it, it is one of those uh, those areas where municipalities have a unique advantage given their proximity to uh, to the citizen. Uh, Lena, I want to I want to turn over to you uh, and and you know, first of all, you're 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 more than welcome to expand a little bit more on what on what Cassie was saying because I'm curious to hear the the construction sector's uh, perspective there. But I also want to know which are the uh, the issues that you think are most important to tackle. From that, from that civil engineering perspective? First of all, I, I would like to say there's a lot of things happening already. And what is most important from a regulation perspective is that business is given a quite clear signal from policymakers regarding the, the uh, path and the journey to, to join. And that means we need to do a massive transformation. There's needed to be quite a lot of investments in new solutions, development and innovations for low carbon materials, uh, energy solutions that, that are heading towards much more uh, buildings that are not just uh, being uh, energy, lean on energy, actually buildings that are producing or are being energy plus buildings. So to all of those, transformation to actually take place. A clear direction from regulation is really important. And, and mentioning here the ETS trading system, actually putting a price on carbon is such a thing. Another thing is the EU taxonomy on sustainable finance. That as well is kind of tapping into the blood system of the business, stating that the performance, the sustainability performance has a value. And that means that you're starting to build the business case. Because the good news is there is a lot of technical solutions out there that we could apply already now to make actually quite a jump on this journey to a transformation for a more green and low carbon economy. However, we need to secure the business case in order to make this happen as fast as we want to. And there, I think regulations has two really major roles. One is to ensure there is a, a strong signal, just like we have been mentioning, but the other also being mentioned to also use the power of public procurement to state sustainability requirements. When doing so, you are ensuring that the whole market is getting a push in the right direction. And if I may take one example, because I think we have such a great example of European cooperation when it comes to this, um, 13 European countries 
are together cooperating on building a, an amazing research facility, the European Spallation Source, the ESS. And it's built in the southern part of Sweden, and Skanska was honored to actually be the ones that are building uh, this facility. It has extremely high levels of sustainability ambitions and targets. One of them, building this massive uh, research facility stating that our clients, these 13 European nations, stating that they have an aim of zero waste in this construction project. And that's amazing to think, to set such a target of zero kilos waste. And actually, that's something that is being upholded in this project. And it has been running now for about seven years, and it's in the in finalizing state. And having a client that are setting such an ambition, ensuring circular solutions, making it a business case, that is something that we need. So regulations to do the shift, making also the business case together with finance and business and using the strength of sustainable public procurement. I think those are important aspects of the solution going forward. Uh, Commissioner, uh, turning to you, I'm going to ask you in a minute about your your experiences in in your home country of Estonia. But I wanted to uh, to uh, just uh, refer to the points that, that Lena was just making. So, uh, can can we expect uh, her 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 two concerns in terms of regulation to be reflected in in what's coming out of Brussels during the next few months? Well, I can only echo, uh, echo uh, what uh, what uh, panelists are saying that uh, that it is important to make um, the uh, well, um, the environment uh, favorable uh, so that uh, individuals and businesses will make right decisions and will put uh, them into practice. And uh, this is this requires legislative and regulatory framework. Um, but as I was mentioning, uh, um, a lot has been done already with, uh, for example, this clean energy package already. This creates a uh, solid basis. And now, now um, we will add Add with uh, with our energy efficiency and uh, and renewables directives uh, piece into the puzzle and later this year with uh, buildings proposal. So um, um, and and of course there is another very important angle that we have to we have to well um, um, encourage um, the um, development and um, uptake of new technologies um, um, because. Um, they they accommodate actually more effective and and uh, cheaper innovations, and we do that with our different programs too. So starting with Horizon and uh, and the Life program, and we are uh, we do have skills agenda for uh, um, upgrading the um, know how right uh, uh, and right skills uh, of innovation sector workers. So uh, so different initiatives uh, that each add a uh, a important uh, piece to this uh, broader target. Indeed. Uh, uh, Commissioner, I did want to ask you, because during your time in the Estonian government, you were able to take uh, part in, in, the, in the national renovation efforts over there, which have been widely touted as a success. Do you, do you want to give us some, some pointers or maybe uh, tell us about what are, what are the lessons learned in, in that process? Well, um, yes, indeed. Coming from Estonia, I had no. Uh, con uh, I need. Uh, uh, I needed no convincing that the renovation makes a sense. Uh, because uh, there are wonderful examples uh, how uh, how people actually uh, will save significantly after their buildings are renovated. Uh, partly it might be uh, because uh, we do uh, in, back home uh, in Estonia there are very cold winters. Uh, but but what happened actually uh, was that uh, that renovation programs were were uh, extremely extremely popular. So the applications um, <coughs> came in at an incredible rate if we uh, if we um, offered uh, co-financing, and and um, actually all the funds um, um, they were committed uh, in a matter of hours uh, following the opening of the calls, and uh, and um, well, um, mm, well basically. Um, what worked was a, was sharing best practices. So, if in the neighbourhood, uh, first uh, building, multi-apartment building, was renovated, then uh, all of the others wanted to to get to the same benefits. 
and uh, and um, and in this regard, uh, this is also a very good example how housing communities do work together um, to take um, um, to take this responsibility because uh, not all the renovation uh, will be financed by public funds. Um, the private donors they also have to contribute, and uh, and uh, and this is one one of the um, um, examples uh, that uh, that um, these kind of countries can share how to um, how to organize housing communities, how to um, support the engagement, and uh, and how to well give them uh, technical assistance uh, because well. Well, all of these households, they are doing renovation most likely first time ever. So, uh, the, so technical expertise plays a important role too. Commissioner, I want to follow up on that uh, because we've we've uh, received half a dozen questions about this, and and certainly it is one of the the, the biggest dilemmas uh, associated with the renovation wave. Uh, ultimately, you know, with with the example that you just gave with Estonia of of, uh, of housing blocks uh, coming together to to move it forward. That's, that's, that's clearly the spirit that would be uh, desired, but uh, for some of the bloc's uh, poorest countries, it really is a, a challenge. Uh, now, I'm, I'm, I'm very familiar with a case in, in Portugal which uh, suffers from devastating ev energy poverty problems, has, has people that, that freeze to death in the winter and others that, that uh, pass out from the heat in the summer. And uh, one of the biggest challenges to getting uh, changes made is just the fact that since the, uh, the median salary is so low, it's very difficult for apartment blocks to come to an agreement and have all residents agree to back this sort of renovation. Yet on the other side, the government is fully aware that if they pass this responsibility onto the building's owners, that can also be a major challenge. So I'm, I'm curious to hear how we get around this and also how much uh, member countries can look to Brussels for economic support, considering that this might be a, a lift that is beyond uh, some, uh, some uh, EU members' capacity at a national level. Well, there will be significant funds available, um, even out of uh, recovery and resilience facility. The member states uh, should dedicate 37% uh, of those funds to climate-related action, and well, um, part of this uh, definitely will be channeled um, into the renovation activities. And from our side, um, we uh, we advise member states uh, to, uh, to tackle energy poverty and uh, to address. Um, share of uh, available funds um, exactly uh, to the renovation of the um, worst performing buildings, because it uh, tends to be the vicious circle that uh, people who live in poverty, their living conditions are worst, and, uh, and that has definitely impact to their health. Um, and, and uh, of course, um, basically, um, because tenants, they tend to be the ones who are uh, paying um, heating or cooling bills. Hmm. Um, um, there might be a proven that uh, owners who just rent out the facilities are no, not well so convinced that these kind of uh, investments are, are um, well, economically um, justified for them. So we have to well, um, push this with a regulation too that uh, um, that um, that convince them that these kind of uh, investments are necessary. I, I want to jump uh, back over to 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 Emmanuel because uh, you know we 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 all remember the the yellow vest protest in in France that came also from that backlash to to uh, to. Uh, what was meant to be a progressive climate action uh, i'm curious to hear how concerned france is with this issue and i've heard uh, a certain amount of criticism about the the, the french uh, renovation policy in that it seems to be spread out near to the end of, of 2030 and there are concerns that that might affect the the accomplishment of the goals uh, how, how is france approaching this issue overall to make sure that there isn't massive citizen backlash to uh, to to this very necessary uh, initiative yeah, it's it's really the issue, or actually the main issue of, of renovation. You, you were talking about how to trigger renovation uh, and, and from a, a household's perspective, and and that is a social cultural issue. But the the main focus we have, and that is to avoid a phenomenon like you said as the gilets jaunes, or uh, is to target uh, as as a priority the poor households. Um, for example, um, we have about we have a, um, a massive grant 
to households uh, who renovate their houses, uh, which is called Matrim Renov. It, it's a new one, it's a, it's a huge success. And two thirds of the households having it are poorer households because we have a very progressive, um, um, a, a, a progressive scheme into how much you, you give uh, to, uh, to the households. And so the, the 40% of the poorer households are receiving about 80% of the, of the money in the, um, in, in the total amount. And that is a massive shift from what we used to do in the past, uh, which was a, a simple uh, tax credit uh, that only the, um, the wealthiest uh, were benefiting from. And, and so I, I think this focus is, is really a, a major key for, for success in, in such policies. And then you have what the commission said about technical assistance. I mean, you have to help those people to um, to, to to do the, to to design their project for the renovation of their houses, uh, to choose uh, the build uh, the builders and and what work has uh, has uh, have to be done. And that is why we are uh, really uh, with region with the regions and the local authorities. We are really developing a new public service, actually, like you have the public service for tax or for unemployment, you, you have one for uh, housing renovation. Uh, and, and that is a, also a, a key point to, to ensure that people are really, you, you take them by the end to, uh, uh, to achieve their renovation. So uh, that is mainly the, the, two, the two triggers we, we use uh, for that. Cassie, let's get you in here. I'm, I'm curious to hear your, uh, your thoughts on this issue. And I also want to hear about uh, your thoughts about communication, uh, which is to say, how do, how do we get people on board with this, especially at a, at a city level? Yeah, sure, thanks. And, and certainly the, looking at the co-benefits of retrofit programs and also targeting those to most in need is something that a large number most of our cities face and have different ways of dealing with. So I'll start with that kind of how do you assess and quantify some of the co-benefits. So we do provide some support to cities and, and they also share examples of where they have quantified the, the job creation opportunity the health benefits and the wider economic benefits of any of their retrofit programs. So a good example is, is relatively recent where Milan retrofitted 300 social housing units by really highlighting and showcasing the health benefits for residents. That was one of the ways of getting buy-in. And, and some of those benefits included job creation of, of 1,600 to 3,000 full-time jobs, obviously CO2 emissions avoided, but also um, estimated 250 fewer people in energy poverty as a result of the retrofitting. So really giving tangible and quantified impacts of those programs to be able to say, to really dri drive them forward and ensure that they're happening. So let me ask you, I'm not, I'm not sure if you can go into, into, into that level of detail, but with the, with the Milan scheme, for example, how did they actually get to the, the residents? Did they, did they just uh, you know, publicize these, these advantages through the media? Did they actually reach out? Did they hold uh, meetings with the local communities? So this was, yeah, this was social housing units, mm -hmm. so it was also municipal building stock. So there was yeah. already good communication between the city and the residents. As it was, they were the kind of owner and occupier, you know, of the occupier of the of the block itself. Sure. So that was a that was a big help. I, I think in terms of so then I'll just also talk about about vulnerable um, residents. I think as well. So there is a need to target interventions, you know, really to the vulnerable, as Emmanuel was just mentioning. And we have seen a number of cities develop um, sort of vulnerability maps where it identifies where you've got the most vulnerable residents. So that might be due to a number of different factors that can be depending on the context of the city, but could be age of occupants, uh, age of the housing stock itself, um, and also, for example, um, hotspots in the city. So areas of the city that are most likely to be affected by the urban heat island. And so using that kind of citywide mapping allows targeting not only of the city to individual households, but actually of whole programs. You know, when we are hearing about interventions that are saying, OK, here out to the sector, out to the, the, the built environment sector, go and deliver these retrofits, utilising subsidies or, or meeting mandatory minimum standards. These are really the areas where they should be targeted and delivered first. And this is seen as a very effective way of targeting work and a, a great role that I think cities can provide in that policy rollout. And then communication. Stakeholder engagement is, is vital, totally agree. And, and I think there's a number of different methods that we're seeing cities use. 
in some cases having kind of community um, consultation activities and stakeholder engagement events throughout policy development, but also setting up kind of um, community councils as well with representatives from different groups. And so actually having co-creation of policy and co-creation of policy, I'm sure everybody on the panel would, would agree is the ideal solution to this. It can be hard, it can be long, it can be difficult, it can be you know a big stretch uh, for policymakers, but it does lead to, to great results. And I think any methods that we've seen where co-creation happens have delivered the, the greatest rewards. Indeed, Lena. Turning to you, I don't, I don't know if you have any any anything else to add over uh, with with regards to this general topic. But I'm also curious to hear a recurring a recurring complaint, and we're we're getting a lot of questions about it. Is just the 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 cost of some of the of the sustainable materials that can be used for these renovations. So. Uh, you know, the, the general question would be, is greening buildings just inherently expensive? And uh, how, how, do we, how do we get this in there in a way that uh, even Europe's most vulnerable citizens can, can, can ensure that their buildings can also be renovated and be energy efficient and, uh, and really be at the, at the level of, uh, of quality of life that all Europeans should expect and deserve? First of all, as stating uh, when it comes to that question, if, if it has to be more expensive, we have done quite a lot when it comes to uh, cost and carbon calculations. And what we have found, uh, actually by, by tracking the past 10 years uh, costs, uh, from a carbon perspective and analyzing it from one of our business units that's approximately 10% of Skanska revenue, we did find that when we start to kind of uh, chase carbon, we can also cut costs. So it is uh, not always the, the, to, to state that a greener building or working for, for more sustainable solutions has to be more expensive. Quite the contrary. Uh, when we are adding the perspective of sustainability, we are broadening our minds for new ways, processes and ways of working. At times, being much more lean on resources and being able to use resources, uh, including times and transportations, better planning, and by that, using less materials, using less transports, etc. So I would like to kind of challenge the assumption that it has to be more costly. Secondly, if you are being more cautious about your resources and your planning, you can also have circular solutions. And yet again, having regulations that are letting you to use a circular perspective. So we have one example, one of our buildings where we really try to, to use a circular way of thinking and actually reusing 77,000 PET bottles uh, as part of the wall materials and insulation and reusing 5,000 meters of window framings in a new building from an old building. And being able to reuse material from old buildings that would be otherwise be classified as waste, I think that is a splendid solution going forward. It may take a bit more of a time because you need to plan and think in another way, but if you are getting the, the concept and the competence, it does not have to be more costly. Having that said, doing everything when you do it for the first time, when you innovate, et cetera, of course, you need a bit of an investment. But I would also like to address the aspects that we've been talking about here when it comes to affordability, mm -hmm. because it's such an important aspect that we have sustainable, high quality and affordable buildings as well. And Skanska has a concept together with IKEA, we call it Bokluk. And that is where we're aiming for modern quality and sustainable buildings for all, so to speak. And having that dialogues with the, with the cities that wants to ensure that you're having a, an inclusive city where you can also have housing and affordable buildings for all. I think having those discussions on the sustainability area where you are pairing the environmental aspects as well as the quality of life, inclusiveness and buildings and housings for all, I think that is really important for us to keep up that dialogue. Uh, for, for, for Lena and, and, and Cassie, uh, just following up on that question, and I don't want to get too folksy here, but one of, the, one of the comments that we've heard from a lot of member states is that it, it seems like during the, the latter half of the 20th century, uh, a lot of uh, 
old common sense urban planning was was lost in part because of the of the greater dependence on cars and so forth. And one of the examples that I that I heard, and I, I, I hate to go back to, to Portugal, but it's just a, it's a wealth of, of these types of examples. They were pointing out that, for example, in the Alentejo region, where they had traditionally built the houses to be low and with these uh, these thick walls to conserve the, the the heat during the winter, the cool during the summer, that tradition had been lost. They had been you know started uh, just uh, building these these. Uh, these uh, very uh, traditional, almost brutalist building blocks during the 60s and 70s, and, and these places were impossible to live in now. They're unbearably warm in the summer. They're incredibly cold in the winter. Uh, do we, do we, is, is this really something that relies on, on uh, cutting-edge technology, or is a lot of it just rethinking how we live in cities and then also going back to some more common-sense solutions to, to, to how we're living inside of our, of our, our, our spaces throughout the block? So maybe I can come in. There. Um, I think it's a mixture, probably. I think certainly there's, um, and if we're looking at new development and in growing cities, you know, we, we want to ensure that firstly we're optimizing the existing building assets we have. Yeah. So we need to be making the most of those existing buildings and adapting or reusing them where possible. I think that for me, that's beyond actually just reusing materials through demolition. That's the next stage. First, we want to be reusing and maximizing the use of the assets and the lifetime of the assets first. And then the next one is to then, where necessary, we need to then reuse and recycle the materials to be able to then create lower carbon materials for rebuilding. But I think in between those two things, we should be planning, designing and building for the future and with circularity. So we need to be ensuring that our buildings are resilient, uh, to the climate resilience, and also do encompass, as Lena just mentioned, super important point about quality of life as well. They actually deliver high quality of life for residents. And then also we need to have in mind circularity so that they're designed to, to be recovered, to be reused, to be kind of deconstructed and to be adapted over the lifetime and ensure that we have a long lifetime of our assets. We've already heard all of the stats this morning about uh, how long you know, all of the existing buildings we already have will, will take us into the future. So I, I would say we need to start with some of that optimizing of the assets and, and not taking the approach of saying, okay, we've got some assets that are tricky to deal with now, let's knock them down and start again. We should be looking at trying to increase that that lifespan. I yeah, I'm, I'm I'm glad you say that because uh, we 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 had a, a great uh, question submitted. Or I, I I love how this phrasing is done, uh, and this and this really does go to the commissioner and it goes to Emmanuel. It goes to all of you. How do we ensure that today's construction don't become the renovations of tomorrow? Do we have the standards in place, or do we need to do more to to, to make sure that what's going up now isn't going to be an, a, a problem for energy efficiency in the future? Commissioner, let's let's go ahead and start with you. Yes, of course, we do have standards for new buildings, hmm. and uh, and um, well, um, and the are they strong enough? Do they need to be beefed up, or, or are we at the at at the right level? Um. Well, um, there are some challenges uh, that are ahead of us. For example, uh, what. Uh, energy source is still used for new buildings um, to heat or cool. So uh, basically our task is to build buildings that keep heat inside and doesn't let um, um, in the summertime um, 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 the, uh, the living environment uh, to be heated, uh, heated um, um, from outdoors. And, and you gave a very good example from 60s and 70s and, uh, and uh, apartment buildings where it's uh, very difficult to live in. We have to keep in mind that most probably those buildings will stay around uh, even after 2050 yeah. uh, uh, when we will achieve our cli climate neutrality. So we have to address uh, the existing building stock. But for new buildings, there are already significantly higher standards where we prior prioritize energy efficiency. Emmanuel, turning to you, at the, at, at the national level, does work need to be continued uh, to, to, to reinforce those building standards to make sure that, that we don't have this, re this repeating problem uh, decade after decade? Yeah, that's a very good question, actually. Uh, I, I think we, we have made huge progress uh, over the past uh, few years, uh, especially in France with our regulation for the new buildings, uh, the one dating from uh, 20. Uh, 12 uh, was already uh, quite good, uh, but the new one is addressing exactly what the commissioner said about not only uh, heating needs uh, in, in the winter, 
but also how you ensure that the building is ready for uh, uh, higher temperatures and more frequent um, uh, heat wave. Yeah. And, and that is it's essential if, if, we were, if we want to ensure the resilience of our uh, building stock in, in the next decades. And, and maybe um, I, I could say that there is a, a good example in Europe, it, it's Sweden. I mean, Sweden addressed this challenge of very high uh, performance standard in new buildings already in the 70s. And now they are the most performing country in terms of uh, uh, energy consumption in buildings. So we are just doing what Sweden was doing uh, uh, 40 years ago. Uh, so that, that is a, a path to follow and, and now addressing this, this uh, challenge for the, the with, a, with a, I mean, that's a that's a very challenging. Uh, that's a very uh, a flattering comment that we can we can use to toss it over to Lena. Lena, what are what are your thoughts? I, I think it is really important for us to to think about how can we retrofit or, or renovate old buildings with the highest possible level when it comes to energy efficiencies. And actually, Skanska, we've been doing a concept in in the Nordics or in Norway. We call it powerhouse. And it's actually one of the most advanced concepts when it comes to energy plus buildings, when you think from, from also taking into account the energy needed for producing the materials. And what we're doing there is also using geothermal solutions as well as solar solutions in order to have a building that actually produces more energy than it is being used through during its lifespan, including materials. And by that, once the building is up and running, it means it does not only provide itself with the energy needed, it does have a surplus, which can be shared to other buildings or for that, for that say, also to uh, electrical vehicles and being possible charging places for electrical bus buses, etc. I think we have to have a new way of looking at buildings. It's not just for those being inside the buildings, it's also those being around the buildings. How we actually have buildings being a part of a greener, low carbon, more inclusive societies, they can do deliver so much more than our kind of standard way of thinking of a building. They are part of a city, they're part of a community, and they can contribute in an ecosystem. If we start to think of them for example, as being potential energy production and charging electrical buses. So having more of these dialogues as with, with cities, with regulators, with clients, or for those for that part, with, with those that are actually doing the transformation when it comes to transportation and electrifying transportation, I think our different industries need to cooperate on the development and innovation for a more sustainable society. And we all have key aspects, key knowledge to chip in here. And none of us has the one solution because we need to cooperate in an ecosystem. So not just uh, what the European Union can do for your building, but what your building can do for the European Union in terms of, uh, of that relationship. That, uh, that, makes, that makes absolute sense. We don't have too much time left, so I, I do want to go around the panel and, uh, and uh, see if you guys have any additional thoughts to the legislation that uh, Commissioner Simpson was mentioning before. Uh, maybe highlight what you're looking forward to in terms of, of what's coming down the line from Brussels. So uh, let's go ahead and start with Cassie, and we'll, we'll go in reverse order. Thanks. I, I would maybe just add on the on the last point as well Please. about you know this this need for zero carbon ready buildings. I think this is super important that we we actually have a lot of the solutions already where we can upgrade the the fabric of the building and we understand what that is and what the needs are. And then I think we need to have the future sources of energy for the building in mind, so that when these are kind of when we have fully decarbonized heat then the buildings are, are ready to take those and they don't need further upgrade. And then Lena's point is, is great, right? Yes, we should be looking at built environment and our buildings as assets on our energy systems and they should all be working together. Probably there's an innovation gap that needs closing to be able to get to that point, but it's not too big, but we shouldn't wait for that. We should actually be able to deliver our kind of zero carbon ready buildings right now. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't prevent that happening. 
Um, so that was maybe just my reflection on that. Um, in terms of, of future legislation, I mean, something that we've seen uh, works well across a number of our cities is mandatory performance standards. Mm -hmm. There's some great examples from US cities, if anybody's ever interested in, in digging into those, um, around uh, introductions of building energy performance standards. Uh, Washington, D.C. have introduced this, this relatively recently, uh, really putting all housing on a pathway to achieving net zero energy standards. And, and ratcheting up those standards over the years so that performance is improving over time and that also costs can be spread out over time. So this is, uh, yeah, is looking very successful and, and, and I think could be an effective tool to be implemented across the EU. C Commissioner, should we expect something to, to the, in, 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 that, in that direction? Yes, as I was mentioning, uh, these um, well, mandatory um, performance standards uh, they uh, they will be part of our proposal, but I generally believe in motivation rather than punishment, and I think that uh, um, well there are already uh, uh, well incentives uh, in in place for innovation and resiliency to improve these incentives, and and um, uh, as we have seen in recent months when the member states are, are preparing their recovery plans, um, member states' interest in innovation is strong. And now um, we will we will create this our proposals also predictable environment so that uh, that additional investment decisions uh, will be made. Indeed, Lena, let's hear from you. I think we have all covered some some great aspects, but but none of this will actually make it if we keep all great solutions or new innovations etc on the shelf. They have to be put on in use. And for that, the business case has to really be uh, emerging at a faster pace. I think regulations, what's being done now when it comes to sustainable finance, is extremely important when it comes to that. I also hear from international investors that they are keenly looking into what Europe is, are doing right now when it comes to sustainable finance. And why I'm mentioning this when we're talking about the built environment is due to the fact that a lot of people are, are saving money in pension funds. That is long-term investments, and you have to put them somewhere. Investors tend to put a lot of the long-term investments into real estate, infrastructure, uh, green energy, et cetera, all of that is in vital parts of the, of the built environment. And having the regulations, a clear path when it comes to directions on sustainable finance, an expectancy on sustainability performance on, in the built environment, that is helping the business case. And that's something that is what's of the most uh, urgency right now. We have a lot of great solutions. There's a lot of great technology already out there. We have to use it at a much more scalable level, as well as we need to ensure that business are doing what they do the best, to invest in more efficient solutions and scale them. And if we tell them that the business case is sustainable, that's what they're going to invent, and that's what's going to be scaled. I see you nodding, Commissioner, so I expect you agree with, with, uh, with what Lena's saying. Well, yes, well, uh, I can agree that uh, right now there is still uh, a low uptake of, uh, of digital and the innovative technologies by the construction <laughs> sector, and uh, we will address this, uh, this also through different uh, um, tools. Well, we will have um, Horizon Europe and uh, digital innovation hubs and, uh, uh, and, uh, and experiment. Um, experimentation uh, facilities just to well address uh, that uh, that uh, digital tools can help us uh, um, to achieve um, um, progress uh, that is needed and well um, it helps us also um, to use materials um, um, more wisely and 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 um, uh, and reduce costs Indeed. Uh, Emmanuel, I want to toss it to you, and I also want to ask you, uh, independently from what you are, are looking forward to at a national level, I want to hear your thoughts about all this talk of uh, involving buildings in the, in the ETS uh, and, uh, and, and get the perspective uh, from, from Paris. What, do, what have you got for us? Yeah, uh, so maybe I'll start with that point. Uh, actually, the extension of the e ETS to uh, buildings is Actually, you have pros and cons. Uh, uh, you mentioned it, um, and, and what the, the minister of Portugal said about that. Uh, you have pros because uh, it's it's a way to put uh, carbon in, into the prices and to to foster uh, renovation in, in initiatives from the energy uh, energy producers. But at the same time, you 
we, we really have a concern about the social impact and the, the burden it, it may have on, on uh, the household. So I, I couldn't say today uh, what, what is the French position about uh, that point, but I mean, uh, that, that's something uh, debatable and, and we, we have to, to go further into uh, how it uh, may look. Um, but maybe a question to the commissioner about the, the regulations uh, uh, maybe coming in at the European level. Uh, as Cassie said, we, we really have to decar decarbonize uh, energy sources when we can uh, and, and take all the opportunities we have. Uh, and for example, in France, we will forbid uh, the installation of a uh, new oil heating system, which are really uh, very polluting, uh, in existing buildings, in existing buildings, when the system is done or has to be replaced. So um, that is something we are, we are doing now. And we see the same policies at local or national level in, in the Netherlands and Italy or other member states. And so the question at the European level would be, uh, uh, can, could we think of forbidding uh, those equipments uh, uh, on the European market? And not only forbidding in, to install it, but just to sell it. And, and so that we have a, a level, level playing field and we foster those, those uh, policies. Commissioner. Well, basically, if we want to achieve uh, climate neutrality, then um, well, building sector has to be decarbonized. And there are well, there are very, very different heating solutions. Well, uh, in Nordic Baltic region, um, they do use um, biomass, uh, which uh, which adds a lot to our renewable targets. Um, then there is um, um, there are already existing solutions uh, how to use electricity. Um, well, um, and, uh, and, and of course, then we have member states who are still using hard coal. Uh, uh, and I think that uh, the clearest, uh, clearest message is actually the price of carbon. When you make uh, your investment decision, when you are deciding uh, which kind of heating system you will, uh, you will put in place when you build a new building. Well, uh, after this... Uh incredibly timely discussion. I'm afraid we're out of time, but before we go, let's just have a look at the results of our second poll. So uh, if they'll bring them up on the screen, let's see what we've got. So the, uh, the question again was, uh, will the decarbonization uh, of buildings be mm -hmm. most accelerated by, oh, did, I thought we had done this one already. Uh, performance standards for construction, circular designs, or low carbon materials. No, it's, it's correct. Uh, and, uh, and again, we have, uh, exactly half of the uh, participants saying all of the above. So, uh, so once again, we need a coordinated effort to, uh, to reach those goals. Um, I want to thank our, our exceptional panelists, Emmanuel, Lena, Cassie, and of, of course, uh, Commissioner Simpson uh, for being here today. I, I think this has been uh, illuminating for our audience and certainly a very lively and interesting discussion. Uh, and I also want to thank our audience for sending such compelling questions, which I think really, uh, really pin down our members and, uh, and got them to share some, some, some really fascinating thoughts. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank our partner, Wholesome, uh, for making this event possible. Uh, and uh, please feel free to send us uh, feedback. You can reach us at events at politico.eu. From Brussels, I am Maitor Hernandez-Morales. Thank you so much for attending this uh, Politico Live event, and uh, we will see you again shortly. <laughs>